Like we said during the prayer, I moved over on this side. I ripped, I ripped this side off all the time because I got the, the, the deal over there. I said, no, I'm not doing that today. I'm going to move it over on this side. Man, when we see that, um, just that, that vision, uh, that illustration alone, it, it, it gets us wondering because the guy's reading, you know, he's reading the Bible and he's seeing all these miracles in the Bible. And you know, the question is, the question we have to ask is, is, is God still working this way? Is that God still working these types of miracles, these types of Jordan and Danielle's baby type miracles? These types of miracles, is he still doing these things? I think in this series that we've been doing, the summer series is looking at stories in Scripture where God is doing miracles. It's cool for every age. I don't care if you're young, you're sitting up here like, oh, church, Sunday, whatever. You're in the front row, you hear a miracle in Scripture, you see God doing cool stuff, you're looking at it, you're like, man, that's the God that all these old people are singing about? Man, that, that dude is like awesome, right? He's like cool. What are the words he's? I, you don't use that word anymore. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I need to get on YouTube or something. But you stop, Kerry. But no, you know, you, you think, man, this is the same God. He's doing these types of miracles. And then we, as, as, as adults, and we, we've heard the stories maybe, or maybe we haven't. It's the first time, and we're like, man, is this really just a story? But do we believe, do we really, really believe that God is still performing these types of miracles? I was riding in, the, um, in my car uh, this, we have... Um, uh, entertainment system, I call it, in my car that still runs VCR, and, um, and uh, so we have to get old tapes, you know, get, find old tapes on, on, at the flea market, all right, but, so my mom is actually the flea market, so I go out there, and I ask mom, you got any old VCR, you know, she's like, oh, I buy them up at the garage sale, and she's like, I, I got one, I'm going to let you borrow, so, so she, she let us borrow Prince of Egypt, now my boys have seen Prince of Egypt, and, and you know, of course, pastor's kids, you got to watch Prince of Egypt, it's in the manual, and so they love Prince of Egypt, so that's like one of their favorite movies, so we're, we watch it now. It's just in the car. And so, um, you know, Ty's like, hey, yeah, I want to, let's watch Prince Breeze. So we put it in. And it gets to the part, it gets to the part where, uh, of course, the, the plagues are happening. It gets to the part where, where, you know, where Ty's favorite part is, is, the, is the sea parting. And some of you, have, I've shown it three times already in, in a sermon. But, you know, and, and the whales are in the, in the shadows of the water. And, you, and it's so cool. And he's back there. And, and, you know, he's seven now. So when you're seven, you start asking questions about, you know, the Bible and sex and stuff. And so... You, um, and so he's sitting there, and, he, and he's, at, you know, he's like, hey, Dad, Dad, did this really happen? He wants to know, he's like, is this a true story? What you going to say, parent? I told him, I'm sitting there with my seven-year-old's backseat. I'm driving. I'm, I wanted to, like, pull over because this is the moment, right? Isn't this the moment that we set the foundation for True belief or not. So if I say to him, let's go with, let's go with, uh, let's go with choice B. If I, if I say to him, no, you know, it, it, it's just a, it's a story to, to build our faith. It's just, it, it's, it's someone wrote this story so that when we would grow into our faith as we read it, it would give us an idea about who God is. Like they really don't, you know, scientists, they, they can't really find where this may be happening exactly. And it may be, maybe the Red Sea was just kind of a, a little puddle that kind of just parted because of the wind or something. I don't know, but it's just a good, maybe a good story. But you know what? You should still have faith in God. That's, that's B, right? A for me was, it's absolutely true. And me and, you know, me and my seven-year-old had that moment, that, that fork in the road, road moment. And I saw him in the back, in the rear view, reflecting on watching what's happening here, right? So, either we're establishing our faith continuously, right, as adults, even for our children and for ourselves. So you just can't be for our children, right? Doesn't it have to be for ourselves? Because don't we, don't we ask the same question? And so in the sense, what I was telling my, my son was that God displays his power to confirm his word for us. He displays his power. He has got to show, he's got to do this. He's got to part this sea, son, so that he can confirm his word to his people, right? He's got to display his power so he can confirm his word. This is for free because it's not in my notes, and, I was, and it just came to me as Jackie is like, you know, angelic, right? And so she's singing, and we're like, man, you know, trust is without borders. Walk upon the waters, right? And that's New Testament. And we're like, oh, man, yeah, Peter, get, you know, get out of the boat. You know, step on. Wow, he's walking on the water. You know what's amazing about this is that the miracle first happens in the, in the, in the Old Testament, right? In Exodus, when the sea parts, 
the water parts, and they walk on dry land through the water, right? And we as people should see the story and say, man, God is, he's awesome that you could part a sea and walk through that. So then we're who we are, right? We forget how great God is. We forget. So then we go into the New Testament. I tell you what I'm going to do. I tell you what I'm going to do, God says. I'm not going to part the waters this time. I'm just going to let you walk on top of the water now. Maybe that would confirm to you that I'm still who I say I am. And God displays his power to confirm his word. But you know what happens to us? You know what happens to us? We still ask the question because we had a conversation at work with somebody. We, you know, well, we sat down over lunch, and this guy, you know, he, he doesn't believe that the Bible is real, real. You know, it's just, you know, written by, it's kind of got errors all in it. So we had this amazing conversation. And then you're, you're like, man, no, well, you, so you don't think that's it. So, oh, here comes, you know, oh, well, maybe it's just a story. And then it's just a story. Oh, it's just in theory. And then, oh, maybe, maybe that really didn't happen. Maybe that didn't happen. Oh, or maybe you watched a good history channel theory about how, oh, you know, the flood, no, come on, the flood, that didn't really happen, really. Come on, you're not really believing that. It's just a, again, it's just a good story to make you feel like your faith is real. Just a good story. You know, maybe we have those. But let me tell you what happens. Here's the problem that we all face. We all face. Because we've had these conversations before and we've seen these specials, or we, our own, have, have maybe had doubt, maybe, about this. But let me tell you what happens. Our forgetfulness, here's what it leads to. Our forgetfulness leads to unbelief. Our forgetfulness and say, yeah, just, I don't think I'm going to take that story. And then if we don't take the story, we begin to forget how great God is. We begin to forget that. And our forgetfulness leads to unbelief. We begin to say, ah, because I got a big deal that's about to happen, and I'm going through a major thing right now, that was really just a story that sounds good back in South Kids, but I'm not sure it's really big boy stuff, God, for my thing. And our forgetfulness leads to unbelief. And you know what our unbelief begins to lead to? Complaining. It begins to lead to complaining. And let me tell you, today is a message for us. And there's a miracle in it. You're like, you're cheating us. There, where's, there's no miracle? Come on, give, you better give me the miracle and make me feel good. I'm going to give you a miracle. You'll feel good probably at the end. You're not going to feel good as we're talking about it. But I'm just, just throwing that out there. Today's message, though, is a message we all need. And it's a message that I believe, I believe literally, young people, old people, everybody in here, Keaton, I'm telling you, it's a message literally that will save your life. It will save your life. See, sometimes the miracle that we need is really just perspective. We need perspective in our life. Each and every one of us, when we go through a moment where, <clears throat> you know, it's like, man, just, just, Unbelief leads to complaining, and then we're just complaining about life, and God has eventually say to us, i got to give you some perspective here. Believers. And it's not just preacher talk. Let me just tell you. In Numbers 11, there's a story. In Numbers 11, there's a story where the Israelites had already been delivered from Egypt, Okay. They were going to their freedom, to the promised land. They were going to their freedom. God had already parted the sea for them. They saw the, the whales and everything, and their way had already walked through. So now they're on their way, all right? Not only that, if you're afraid of the dark, anybody afraid of the dark, afraid of the dark, don't like the dark? Okay, don't like Sylvia, I'm with you. Don't like the dark. David cannot do the dark. You still got to have the nightlight. He gave them a nightlight. He said, I'm going to give you a fire by night. It's going to be in a cloud. And it's going to be over. Just like, oh, and, and so everybody who freaks out about the dark, and you're like, what are we going to do? No, it's going to be fine. Oh, but it's going to be hot. How many of you liked the weather this past week? Didn't you like the weather this past week? Oh, everybody's like, oh, cost of living's going to go up now, you know, because it's so nice in the summer here in Oklahoma. No, yeah, it's, it's like, no, everybody's like, man, 67 in July. You like that? Let me tell you who else liked that. The Israelites like that because it's hot. Just like in Oklahoma in the summer, it's hot like that in the desert. So God said, let me give you then a pillar of cloud in the daytime so that I delivered you. We went through the water together. All right, you saw that happen. Then you saw your enemies get drowned by the water. So now you're walking to this promised land. Now you have pillar of fire by night. You have cloud by day. You're cool. It's great. It's fun. You're walking. It's good. You would think so, right? But the Israelites begin to complain. 
Because what they were given to eat, mind you, that was another thing. Well, how are we going to eat when we're out there? I mean, you said this, how is that going to happen, right? Well, God said, listen, here's, there's going to be a dew that rises at night on the ground. And in the morning, you're going to wake up and there's going to be manna, all right? Which literally means, by the way, what is it? All right, some of you freak out. We have this like who's on first, who's on second moment, you know. Um, no, it means when they saw that manna, they said, what is it? That's what it was, manna. Okay, it's called what is it? And so it's sitting there, and it rises up on the ground, and, and it's sitting, and, and, they, and it says it had a look of bedellium, okay? You know what bedellium looks like? Is it like beautiful? It's so beautiful. All right, take a look at what bedellium looks like. This was kind of what bedellium, had a kind of a, a look of bedellium at first. And they thought, whoa, manna, <laughs> all right, what, what is this? And, and, and Moses is like, no, nah, eat it up. This is good, man. <laughs> I think I saw something that looked like that outside of the dumpster this morning when I was doing some trash on the ground. But, no, we, we see. And God said, no, Ray, it's, it's, it's to eat. So you know what they did? He provided. This is what God does. Doesn't he? Doesn't he do this? He provided for them manna in the morning. Similar to something that looked like this, but was good for them, sustained them. But, you know, they had to make it into food. They had to work for it. They had to make it into something, and they did. And it was similar to this. Okay, I, I got it. They have manna at Reasers. You can go. You can, it's, it's, it's amazing, really. And I, I'm not. I'm not. I'll, I'll read this to you. What what they do? They said they they would take this manna, and the manna like coriander seed, and it's color the color of bedellium right there. The people went about and they would gather it up on the ground and they would ground it in millstones and they would cook it in pans. And every time they needed something to eat, it tasted sort of like pastry with the oil on it, like this. Here you go, here you go, Cameron. Yeah, get you some manna. Get you some manna right here. This is manna, manna to eat, manna to eat. Right there, don't, don't let that hit you in the face, all right? Every day, every day you woke up when you freaked out about whether God was going to provide, he said, Michael, get you some manna. Right off the ground, the dirt's from God too, all right? All right? He would provide it, and just because I want to do it, and it's like a Frisbee, Thomas, look at that, right to you. Yeah, right there, all right? And God, good hands, given your talents from God. That talent is from God. He would say to them, what are you complaining about? What are you complaining about? So after all that happened, okay, after all that happened, you, you man is here, drop down, you have everything you need. Here's what happened starting in verse 11. Now when the people, now when the people complained, it displeased. You think I'm joking. I mean, it's not like you're displeased and like, oh my gosh, it gets on my nerves. Like that displeased, not, you know, not like, man, he's a punk, man. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not going to hang with him. That's how we think of displeased. Here's how God thinks of displeased. Oh, oh, you guys are complaining? I, I provided all that for you? Oh, there's a couple of you guys complaining out there, out on the, you know, you didn't want to complain, I guess, inside the town, so you went outside the town to complain. So you're complaining out there. I'll tell you what I did. You see the pillar of fire right there? Bam, zoom, fire down on them dead, gone. That's God's displeasure about complaining. He will display his power to confirm his word. He will. So no, that wasn't enough, I guess. Word didn't go out to everybody that, you know, word didn't go out that, hey, these dudes out there were complaining about the deliverance and they, it didn't look good enough for them. So now, and, and all that he did for them, and he it dropped down, some fire came from nowhere. I don't know if it was God or not. Maybe it was God. But they're not with us anymore, you know, so they're gone. So I guess maybe that wasn't enough. So, in no, so it goes on to say, here, after that happened, they, they, they even gave the place a name for those guys, Tabera. I mean, because the fire of the Lord had burned them. I mean, they got their own place. So then we go into verse 4. That was one miracle. You can just throw that down. Now the mixed multitude who were among them, among the believers, among the Israelites, the mixed multitude begin to crave other things. What do, we know about, what do we know about this? Let me give you a short little deal. This is keeping up with the Joneses is what this is. That's what this is. Because we get around the mixed multitude, right? We can hang around each other every now and then, and we feel, you know, encouraged. We feel like, man, we're, we're thankful. You know, James is up here. He's, he's, you know, giving a scripture about being thankful in all circumstances. But when we, start to, when we start to get around the workplace and maybe around the neighborhood and we see 
something that we want, that's not what we feel like God, you know, it starts to really get mixed up, right? And scripture tells us that the Israelites began to be in the mixed multitude and they started to yield to intense craving. So what did they say? They said, listen, we, we, Moses, what, this, all this right here, this manna and this pastries, it's not enough for us. We, 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 it's not enough. We want meat is what we need. Not only that, let me give you the menu that we'd like to give God. Here's the menu. We need meat because we heard somebody else over here, right over here, the Smiths, they were talking about, not our Smiths, but the other Smiths, they were talking about like real meat, real good meat, and we don't have real good meat, you know, the God's people, and so can we get some real good meat, you know, we need, and not only that, when we were back in Egypt, you hear this, and, and you guys are, are grown-ups, you can go with this, so when we were back in the old place, here's what we got. Before we were with, with, with God and all this, we got to have melons and onions. And all the great grilled mushrooms. We, we got all that back in Egypt. So Moses, can you go and tell God that this isn't good enough and we're tired of this? As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that they're wailing, that they're complaining so much. They went home, into their, they went to their houses. They began to have little community groups of complaining. They said, let's, let's meet Sunday night and Wednesday night. Let's have a group of community complaining. It will be amazing. Um, we'll have some good food. Then we'll get around. and We'll have some good manna. <laughs> and then we'll get around. And, and then we'll complain. They would go to their homes and complain. And Moses, let me just tell you. You ever been around a believer who just complains a lot? Someone who calls on the name of the Lord. I love the Lord. The Lord's great. It's so good. So good. And then they can just complain a lot. How does it make you feel? When you see it. Yeah, if, you're, if you don't like them, you don't want to be around them. You, 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 want, you want to not be around them. They're like, hey, you want to go do lunch? Let's have some coffee. No, thanks. No, I don't drink coffee anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm no, I don't eat food anymore. I'm, we're, not, we're not meeting together. So you'll, just, you'll, you'll want to stay around them. So guess what Moses says to God? He says, I don't want to be, I don't want to be around these people. He says, I, Moses is smart. He says, I don't want to be around these people. Matter of fact, Matter of fact, he, he goes on to say, I can't stand it. I need to be, if you can, if you can just work this out, God, can you kill me? That's what Moses said. Yeah, you would see it around. Oh, my man, this guy for real. Hey, when you have people around who, you who you know should be thankful for their blessings and they're complaining around you, don't you go home and say, just stab me in the heart right now? I, don't, I mean, I don't want to be around this. Let's be real in here. So Moses is saying the same thing. So he can't deal with it. God says, and we'll move faster. God says, okay, well, listen, I'll give you some other spiritual leaders, some elders to be around you. And why do you think we have elders? Because you complain so much, so i got to have elders. And so the elders will come around, and they encourage Moses. Say, listen, we'll take some of the complaining, you know. And so then Moses tells, says to God, okay, now that we have all this, God, guess what? They still complain. How are we going to get them meat that they need? It's starting to become a riot up in here. I'm telling you, how do we do this? And so in verse 18, Numbers 11, verse 18, we're looking at the Bible, so sorry if you don't like that. Then you shall say to the people, here's what you need to do. Get yourselves ready. Dedicate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. Matter of fact, you're going to have not meat for that night. You're not going to have just meat for the next day. You're not going to have just meat for the next months. You're going to have meat coming out of your nostrils and every other orifice you have. This is what God says. You think I'm just, no, read it. Numbers 11, 18. God says, tell them that it's going to be CCs up in here. Okay? And so, most like, are you, wait, how, really? There's, we have 600,000 men. How are you going to do? I don't see, we don't have enough calves for that. Okay, I don't see that. How are we going to do that? And God says, don't, listen, are you shortening my arm is what God says? I'll display my power so I can confirm my word is what God said. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. So, going on. Aren't you loving this story? I mean, isn't it just really encouraging? All right. And so then Moses says, okay, well, I'm not going to shorten your arm. You got the long arm, man. Long arm of the law. I'm not shortening it. All right. So now we'll just see. We'll just see what goes down. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. He says, guess what? You're going to have it coming out of your nostrils tomorrow. And nostrils, whoa, man, everywhere. Okay, and so guess what happened? next day, God performs the miracle he said.
said he would do because he wants to display his power to confirm his word. The next morning, they wake up. And not, as my, my buddy Troy used a big word yesterday, not indigenous to that climate. Quail come flying in with a big wind everywhere. And it says three feet above them for, what does it say, for miles? Three feet above them for miles is their equivalent to space. That's just fluttering above them. Oh, my God. Cookie and Ray Ray, get the grill ready. We's about to have a BBQ in this month. That's what everybody said. We get to baskets, pardon the birds flying everywhere, you know. They can't fly any higher. Can you see that? I don't, we watch a show called The Dome. Sometimes I know you've ever seen that. It's so cheesy and dumb. You can't fly any higher. The dome's on the ground. Boom, boom, boom. Birds are tripping out. They're like, Mom, they're not going anywhere. They're just staying right here. And they're just getting it, man, firing up coals everywhere. We're about to have a deal in here. So they do. They get all of it. I mean, and the promises of the Lord. Oh, my gosh. If I'll just complain. If I'll just share my heart to God that he doesn't give me enough and that he really doesn't take care of us as much as I want him to, he will provide for me and it will be a miracle up in here. Can you imagine the conversation that was happening when all of this quail was sitting right here for them and they were about to eat it? God had performed his memory. He will, God will display his power to confirm his word. So the people ate the quail. Quail's good. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I used to live out in the country. Don't, don't be fooled by my city. I used to live in the country. I'm a country brother, all right? I hate the country. <laughs> I will not lie to you. I think everything's a spider when I see it. You know, I'm like, crickets. We have weird crickets in our house. I don't, it's, I, I'm traumatized. But I used to live in the country, and my, my stepfather, because we were poor, he would go out into this area where you're not supposed to shoot guns probably and shoot quail. And he would get quail, and we say, we're having quail tonight, and it tastes like good chicken. So I just thought, all right, let's, let's do it. It's pretty darn good. God was taking care of these people. God was taking care of these people. So the complainers ate the quail, and they died. That's the God. They ate it. Plague came over them. And they died. You're going to think I'm pretty sick. This is one of my favorite stories. A couple things it does for me. It reminds me of who God is. And when I am complaining and my life is out of perspective, I remember the story from Numbers 11. And I think back for me. And guys, this is often, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'll vulnerable here, vulnerable. When I feel like I am complaining too much about whatever it may be, I remember this story and I come back to it and I say, I say this. I really do. Here's my, I call it a prayer of perspective. I say, God, please don't put me in perspective. Is that good enough? Because I remember Numbers 11. And I say, God, please let me do it. Please let me do it. Some of us, and I have been there, are so foolish that we won't say that prayer. And from what I read in this story, and it is a miracle, I'm sorry if you're so cheating, it's a miracle. I see danger in that story. And I say, I don't want to be that. I've got to remember everything that you brought me through, God. Everything you brought me out of, I'm not going to complain. I'm going to be thankful. 
Jameson, this is incredible how God, Holy Spirit works, and you've you got to believe this, because if you don't, then I'm sorry, you think I'm a liar. I, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, I wrote this in at the end in the office, and I said, I've got to share this, because it says, be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I, when Paul was writing that, I don't think it was a suggestion. I don't think it was just a pleasantry. I don't think he just said, oh, it's just something, just, just be thankful. Just be thankful. Oh, no. I think Paul was writing it and saying, please be thankful. Please. Please be thankful. Because we know what happens when we're not. And some of you may be New Testament people and you say, you know, come on, Pat, you're going Old Testament to scare us into being thankful. And so, you know, that, come on, really, don't, don't do that. All right, I'll go one for you. How about in Acts 5 when Ananias and Sapphira were sharing with the church? And I can only read it in a sense that they said, let me hold back. We're not really thankful for how this works, but let's just hold back a little bit. Let's keep some for ourselves. Remember, they were part of that Acts 2 movement. And they said, let us hold some back. So they roll in with Peter, anointed by the Lord to lead this church. Anointed by Christ Jesus. Peter says, what? all right, Ananias, Sapphira, what you got? They bring what they have and they step back. And Ananias, boom, drops dead. I'm not trying to scare you. I, I'm not. I wouldn't be who I wouldn't be a pastor if I didn't tell you the story. That reminds us that God will display His power to confirm His word. Lastly, I was in the donut shop. The reason of getting our donuts this morning. Again, I have donut ladies. We have you know relationship, not in weird way, Christy. Just, just you know, old ladies. Just they're like, so pastor, getting a donut. You know, come every. Well, what you got today? You know, what you got? And so the Reasers lady asked me now, and I said, I got it for you. You know, and I'm, again, I'm trying to do these bottom lines. You haven't figured it out. I'm like saying things over and over again. You know, he's trying to trick us and pull fish or whatever. Yeah, I'm trying to get you to remember. God will display his power to confirm his word. So I, I said this to her. And I said, here's what I got today. Here's, here's what I have. I said, God will display his power to confirm his word. I was just trying to test it out, actually, because I'll change it up. If it's, you know. So she said, God is loving. He will flood the earth on your head. I said, boom! And I, I was, you don't even know, I was encouraged. I went and got a monster, and I said, I'm ready to go now, baby. Come on. She's like, he's a love. I said, that's it. That's the sermon right there. God's a loving God, but he will flood the earth on your head. And I'm like, there you go. Donut lady, be the, man, she's, she has it the best. Prayer perspective. When you feel like you're in that place and you're complaining, just stop. Do what I do with me. Okay, as Paul says, imitate, imitate me as I imitate in this prayer. Lord, don't put me in perspective. Let me do it myself. How do we do that? We just stop and we say, what do I have to be thankful for right now? I promise you, every one of you, you will stop and say, I, have, I do have things to be thankful for. And let me just tell you, even if you're in a prison cell somewhere and you were wrongly accused and it's dark and it's dingy and it stinks and you are sitting there, you have the thankfulness of your salvation. And everything else fails. You don't got the car you want. You don't live in the house you want. You don't got the job you want. You don't have the quail that you want. Whatever it is. When all else fails, you can say, I have salvation. Thank you, Lord. And I'm just guessing that that will be enough for him not to bring fire down. Pray. Heavenly Father, uh, what an amazing story in Numbers 11. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for that story. That it wasn't left out, that you were like, no, nah, that's going to scare everybody. Don't put that in there. Now, that story reminds us that you are a God who's powerful, and you are a God who keeps your promises to your word. You will deliver us, that you will carry us through. You will provide us 
a, a nightlight. You will provide us coolness. You will provide us food. You will provide us water. You will provide us everything we need in Christ Jesus. And I pray that we can get away from complaining. I pray for those that may not like the story today and they want to go read it themselves. I pray that they will. I pray they'll go and see, Father, and what it means for you to be powerful, for us to have wisdom in our fear of you, the beginning of all greatness. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.